When faced with a series of confronting scandals of serious sexual harassment and abuse, the Defence Chief of the time, David Morrison, realised a seismic shift needed to take place. It was revealed that uh, dozens of members of the armed forces were involved in the distribution of hundreds of explicit emails denigrating women. What could have been described as one of the most male-dominated industries uh, was going to take some serious tough decisions to try and change a culture. Uh, Changing organisational culture is by no means uh, an easy feat for anyone. and Transforming a a working culture from ingrained, long-standing behaviour is really challenging. In a bold move, uh, Mr Morrison uh, addressed the Defence Force in a YouTube video and said, those who think that it's okay to behave in a way that demeans or exploits their colleagues have no place in the army. He said, if that doesn't suit you, get out. He's uh, since been awarded the 2016 Australian of the Year Award for his work on gender equality. And it's something we're going to talk about a little bit tonight as we discuss leadership and uh, Avril Henry, who uh, has worked with David Morrison and with the Army uh, and a number of other organisations for quite some time, uh, joins us in the studio. Good day. Hi, Tony. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. It's good to be here. Happy New Year. Same um, to you. Now, following the release of uh, Elizabeth Broderick's review into the treatment of women in the Defence Force, uh, Mr Morrison asked you to guide and help transform what was a deeply ingrained service. How hard was it? Look, it's always hard changing culture. I've always maintained over the 20 years that I've worked in this space that it's much easier to change systems, processes, policies and develop technical skills. But Mm. what's really hard is to change behaviour. And in order to change behaviour, what you fundamentally have to change is the mindset of individuals. And changing mindset means that people at a very personal level have to challenge their own values and beliefs. So you're talking about challenging a culture that has existed for decades. Having said that, though, it's interesting that in most organisations you always have a small core group who I believe have a vested interest in protecting, quote unquote, the way we've always done things around here. And then that actually tarnishes the reputation of everyone else in the organisation. You'd imagine that uh, the Defence Force Academy is some place that you would have to start. Yes. Uh, because they often say, you know, the difficulties sometimes come from the top down. So if the leadership culture is not right, the rest of the organisation is going to struggle to meet. Yes. The interesting thing, though, is when I look at um, the Army, the Navy, and I've worked in a range of industries that are particularly masculine, like mining, investment banking, etc., is often people at the most senior levels have recognised the change and have started to make that shift in their own thinking. And new people coming into an organisation who have not sort of been moulded into the organisational culture are open to change. I believe that what we often find is in the middle ranks of an organisation, particularly with people who've been there a long time, they've helped to develop that existing culture and don't necessarily want to change it. But you're absolutely right that change has got to come from the top and not just in terms of what they say, but they need to walk mm. the talk. How powerful was the YouTube video? Extremely powerful. And I think it's also because when you watch that YouTube video, you can almost feel how angry and aggrieved Morrison is in his message. And um, there was quite genuine anger because, you know, until he was confronted with not only what happened there, but listening to some of the stories of people who'd been on the receiving end of sexual harassment and assault, he had no idea how it, I suppose in inverted commas, felt for those people because he's the first to say he had never experienced that kind of treatment himself as a man or as a human being. Although we have heard a lot of stories of cadets in the training mechanisms of the army and uh, and military that have 
suffered. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's male and female. So I think it's important that we recognise that often things like sexual harassment and bullying is not about um, the sexual nature of the act. It is very much about an abuse of power. You know, about three years ago, there's a very nasty case in uh, Victoria of um, appalling sexual harassment and sexual assault of a young male apprentice, which Mm. actually ended up in court because um, he took his own life. Part of the difficulty you have here is that we now have social media. So something that might have been quite a limited event, you know, with yes. involving two or three people, all of a sudden half the force seem to know about it because it's yes. been passed on. And, and this is a, a problem and a, and a, and a plus. <laughs> Yeah, look, I think it's not just social media. If I think back to 15 years ago in investment banking, um, it was the internet. I, I think it's, you know, a combination of the internet and social media that now means that if you behave inappropriately, you know, we can think of some of the sports stars who've done that recently, everybody knows because somebody who um, either believes it's inappropriate or believes they stand to gain something can within, you know, seconds place it in a very public forum. One of our early comments on the SMS says Defence Force is a culture of abuse that starts at the top. It's called trauma-based mind control. Um, I think... What I've observed is that in the military, the leadership style is very much about command and control. And over the last three years in particular, I've had many, many conversations, if I take the army, um, with generals, brigadiers, colonels, lieutenant colonels, those very senior people about the fact that you need command and control if you are in a zone of conflict where you want to give people instructions and they need to act very quickly. However, you know, the reality is less than 5% of our armed forces are actually on active service in an area of conflict. The rest of the time they are here in Australia or they're on exercise, where I think we need need to take a much more um, collaborative, encouraging and engaging style of leadership. And I do think we are seeing a generational shift that's been driven now by the fact that more of our senior officers are actually now Gen X rather than baby boomers. Mm, That's interesting. Uh, So, you know, you're getting 50-year-old generals, huh? Well, um, I'm personally very excited and proud of the fact that two of the brigadiers who I coached um, two years ago um, recently have been promoted to general, one of whom is now the military attaché to NATO in Brussels, and are both under the age of 50. And that's not historically something that would have happened Mm. in a place like the army. You know, you needed to um, have... um, I suppose in many ways it's not just about longevity of service but that um, perception of being a certain age and being of a certain level of wisdom, which Mm. is not necessarily the sole ownership of older people. Defence historically largely male-dominated and uh, was there a feeling that uh, some people who were coming to the organisation weren't up to scratch as far as, um, you know... uh, being the sort of men that the the leaders wanted and uh, women being part of the equation, uh, were they seen by many to be out of place? I think it was um, very challenging for women and particularly the women I've interviewed over the years, uh, 20 and 30 years ago. And certainly I think there was a perception that they were out of place And I don't think it was made easy for them. And the reality is that many women across all three services who've been in there a long, long time adapted their behaviour to fit in. Whereas what I'm seeing now with um, younger officers in their 30s um, and more of them, that people are encouraged to be more could I call it themselves, Mm. which means that you can be 
a, a strong leader without being paternalistic or masculine. One of the difficulties, I guess, with uh, the situation is, you know, they are required often to be in, you know, critical situations where, you know, you, you have to have the team, you know, working as one. Yes. And uh, it's, a, it's a difficult balance, isn't it? You know, yes. at times you have to be macho and you have to be there and you have to be there for each other. Yes. And, and yet, uh, you know, that's not normally the way society works these days. But it's interesting if you think about the fact that warfare itself has changed. Mm. And I describe it as World War I and Two. you knew where the enemy was. They were in the trenches, in the tanks, in planes or on ships. Today, we don't always know where they are. They could be next door on a train, on a plane. And I think um, women bring something unique in that often they are more intuitive, often they are better at reading body language or reading between the lines. And if you have a look at um, certain core groups within a place like the army, for example, about 30%, which is quite high, of our logisticians are now women and Mm. a number of people working in intelligence, which is a really important part of defence, are now women. So they don't all have to be soldiers. Sure. Part of the difficulty is also you have to imagine that a lot of the active service people have been impacted by post-traumatic stress. Absolutely. That seems to be a lot more prominent than, uh, than we've even imagined. Look, Tony, I think that um, post-traumatic syndrome has been around for decades. Sure. And I think, you know, if we think back to after World War II and we think to Vietnam veterans, I think we didn't recognise that that is what was wrong when they came back and they behaved differently. I think also socially it wasn't acceptable for men to admit that they needed help or that they weren't Mm. feeling good. Whereas now, you know, you've got everything from Beyond Blue to Headspace to organisations like that and campaigns like Are You OK? that say, speak up. If you need help, we can help you. And in fact, at our three bases, uh, or what we call our combat base, Places in Darwin, Brisbane, um, even now in Sydney and also in Townsville, we actually have rehabilitation centres, which are specifically not just for people dealing with physical um, damage, but also um, mental and emotional stress as a result of um, being in areas of conflict. Uh, We've seen a number of um, very prominent politicians come forward of recent years and say, I've had a mental condition I've had uh, difficulty facing it and uh, I think that with Beyond Blue and a number of the other organizations that are also present in the community uh, it's okay to say I'm really struggling. Absolutely. I think one of the best campaigns, and I'm really proud to have been one of the original ambassadors, is Are You OK? Where we're not only giving people permission to speak up, but we're giving people permission to ask someone who they may suspect is having a hard time, Are You OK? And something as simple as that in any industry, including in defence, can actually make a huge difference to someone. I think what you're talking about, Avril, is also listening. Yes. And this is uh, an allegation that's been made a lot through the decades, not only in defence, in other industries as well, where people feel as though they haven't been listened to. Absolutely. And so, you know, they've told their story and said, that's nice, you uh, worry about it later. And, uh, and they feel underrepresented and uh, under underwhelmed. I think people um, are listening much more now. If you think about um, the number of people in defence who have come forward, you think about some of the royal commissions into child abuse, people are starting to listen because they are recognising that one of the greatest shortfalls of leaders today, and historically in the past, I might add, is that they've not actively listen to their people. And if you look at Generation Y, we did a national survey of Generation Y almost a decade ago, and 75% of the Gen Ys we surveyed said the number one issue they had with their current manager, leader or supervisor was that they did not listen to them. 
Um, and they would say, you know, they think we're young and inexperienced and have nothing of value to add. So what's the point of speaking up? Mm. And I'll be honest and say one of the big things that I have focused on over the last three years in my leadership coaching within the army is getting people to actively listen. And, you know, I find it mildly amusing, but at the same time, very powerful that I actually say to some of these leaders now for the next month, I don't want you to interrupt anyone in meetings. I don't want you to finish people's sentences because they're not talking fast enough. And I want you to go to meetings and have conversations at home and come back and tell me what you heard. And I can't tell you how many of them have come back and said that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Because, you know, most people in leadership positions want to tell rather than listen and want to talk rather than listen or ask questions. And so really what we're doing is we're shifting some of their behaviours from telling and not asking to listening and asking questions. Mm. A lot of uh, younger generation of employees, the Y generation, are expecting more from their leaders. They want, they want to feel valued. They want to yes. be part of the process. Uh, what are some strat- strategic things that... Uh, people in leadership positions can do, particularly if you've got large numbers of Gen Y on on board? Well, look, um, one of the smartest ideas that I've seen um, a leader utilise was um, Chiam Swickers when he was the managing partner at Deloitte and he's gone on to um, run a global um, organisation. And basically, um, during the GFC, he basically asked people, what can we do three things. What can we do to make this a better place to work, um, cut costs and hold on to staff? So he didn't want to cut staff at the same time that we're not increasing revenue. And he said, I don't care um, if you're a receptionist, if you're a junior person, if you're a senior person and a partner, I'm interested in everybody's ideas. So effectively, he was asking for input and then he was willing to listen And, you know, um, when I interviewed him, he said he got 130 ideas. And he said 70% of the ideas that involved using technology to improve productivity or to streamline manual processes came from staff under the age of 30, the Gen Ys. And the flow-on effect of that was that people felt incredibly valued and listened to by virtue of having the opportunity to not only have input, but to actually see their ideas put into place. And, you know, it sounds very simple, but I think the most strategic thing a leader can do, not just for young people, but anyone in the organisation, is number one, to genuinely listen, number two, to ask questions, and then listen to the answers. It's no point asking Mm. people for input and then being dismissive. Um, And the third thing is to be open to diverse opinions and not to dismiss someone's opinion simply because it's different to yours or because they disagree with your way of doing things. Sometimes uh, impossible to believe, but at one stage, you know, for example, job sharing wasn't even uh, on the agenda. And then yes. all of a sudden, a few people came up and said, look, uh, I'm either going to have to leave the organisations or I'll have to go part time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Jenny's feeling exactly the same way. Can we job share? And uh, all of a sudden, people thought, oh, uh, you're supposed to be here for 38 hours a week. Well, yes. how, does, how, is, how does that work? <laughs> yes. And uh, but people thought it through and thought, well, rather than losing Jenny and Jill, yes. um, you know, we can keep them both and their experience and uh, also allow them to have a, a community and a life. Absolutely. Um, and it's really interesting when you empower people to actually demonstrate how they can make that work rather than expect that the organisation is responsible for the practicality of making it work. There's a great example in Southwest Airlines where the roster system is actually run by the staff. So if I can't fly next Wednesday and I've got a shift flying next Wednesday, it's my responsibility to come to someone, say you as a colleague, Mm. and say, can we swap shifts? And um, 
the whole process is run by the employees, which gives them flexibility. They feel trusted. But not only have they got this flexibility and feeling of trust, they want to make it work to prove to the organisation and their bosses that they are not misplaced in having that trust in them. Mm. We used to hear a lot of uh, things from Bob Ansett at one stage when he was running running Budget Rent-A-Car, I think it was. And he used to say, okay, well, we and make great play in the fact that uh, the senior managers actually worked at the bench in the office Mm -hmm. at least one day a month just so that they knew what was happening and, you know, that they, they didn't get lost. Can sometimes leaders get lost and lose the, lose the path? I think they can lose perspective and they are so busy taking that strategic helicopter view that they've lost the ability to see things from the ground up. And I think it's incredibly powerful, not only for their own understanding, but as a role model and example to others, when senior executives literally work on the floor, whether that's on the factory floor, working on an assembly line, whether it's in a branch serving customers, whether it's sitting in a call centre taking calls, it just reminds them what people go through every day because you can really forget and not have any understanding. One of the other aspects of uh, business in the 21st century seems that uh, every company want to uh, give you uh, an opportunity to feed back to them. Uh, <laughs> we, I was just uh, telling you um, uh, about an incident during the news where you know, I had a, a small problem with a, an organisation that uh, weren't delivering. Uh, I rang them. We got the call centre in Manila mm-hmm. and uh, they couldn't hear me terribly clearly. And uh, I sort of said, uh, you know, I was spelling things out to them and uh, it was a real communication breakdown. It wasn't anybody's fault. It was just a, a bad line and, uh, you know, we weren't you know, getting to where we needed to get. And within five minutes, I'm on the internet and uh, this offer comes up for me to discuss the call on, uh, you know, on a small survey. So the businesses, yes, they want to listen to the customers and say that, uh, you know, find out whether you're enjoying the process or not. But sometimes it's pretty painful when it just doesn't go well. Yes. And can I say, while we as a culture in Australia will ask clients and customers for feedback because we want to hold on to them and we want them to refer new business to us, we're not nearly as good at asking for feedback on ourselves as managers and leaders. So we want to tell our employees, and in fact, we don't even do that very well when they're not meeting their key performance indicators or not behaving appropriately. But we're not too good at accepting or receiving feedback on how we can improve as managers and leaders. And yet I think it's one of the most critical skills of leaders is to um, engage in two-way feedback, giving feedback and then being willing to receive it. Mm. A lot of leadership comes down also, I think, to personality type. Yes. You know, uh, can people learn to change the way they relate to the workers and the organisation. Absolutely. Um, One of my favourite quotes from um, Professor Rosbeth Cantor from Harvard University is that um, the leader of the future who will be successful will be he or she who has the ability to build their emotional intelligence, which is about relationship building, listening, accepting diversity. It's also about resolving conflict. And all of those are skills that you can learn as opposed to your IQ, which you can't actually change at all. And even people who are very directive in the way they manage and lead can learn to demonstrate empathy. So you might not feel empathetic, but you can learn the language and the behaviour that enables you to demonstrate empathy for your employees. Mm. One of those uh, terrible things, I suppose, in this uh, technological world that we live in, uh, a lot of employees do start to feel like numbers and not individuals. And uh, that, I guess, is another part of the breakdown. Uh, You know, how you 
get people to be on board and be part of the dream. I would agree with that. I also have great concern that even in the process of um, training and development and educating people within the workplace, more and more we are trying to do that online, which again diminishes the human interaction between colleagues. I also think we send emails to people when we could walk down the corridor and I think we um, also use emails and text messages to say things we might not say to someone's face. And Dell Computer in the US now have what they call Friday free email. So on Fridays, you are not allowed to use the email system to send emails to people. So if you want to communicate with someone, you either have to go and speak to them face to face or pick up the phone and call them. And that's about trying to um, remove some of that reliance on technology to interact with people because a lot of if you think about it, in the process of communicating using technology, we lose body language and we often lose the ability to determine someone's tone of voice. So you can completely misread the words and the intent of a message because you can't see or hear the person. So you make the wrong call. In fact, uh, there seems to be a, a case that uh, involving ICAC at the moment where, uh, you know, the tone is very much uh, what has been debated, not the yeah. words because they've become public, but uh, the tone in which they were delivered, you know, yes, it became the, uh, the great mystery. Paul the Truckee says, I used to work for a company whose boss thought all of us drivers were scum and could be found in any pub. Uh, the turnover of drivers was like a revolving door. And, you know, and um, thanks for that um, comment because I actually believe that um, when an organisation doesn't value its own people, then people will not feel valued. And I think to um, determine somebody's value on the basis of the job they do is actually very poor leadership because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you're an executive or whether you collect garbage or whether you're a cleaner or whether you're a lawyer – Every job adds value to the economy and therefore, in my view, has value and therefore the person is making a contribution. And I think, unfortunately, there are continue to be and probably always will be people in society who will make a judgment about somebody on the basis of their job, which, Tony, I'm sure you understand if you consider the position of migrants. I've met taxi drivers from China who are cardiologists and I've met professors from India because what happens when you're a migrant, and ironically, when I first came to Australia as a migrant, as a qualified accountant, I worked for four months as a typist and thought I you know, was going to go nuts because... Um, that wasn't what I was trained to do. But if you've got to earn an income, you do what you have to do. Mm. But you still need to treat people with respect. Part of the problem is also it impacts your bottom, bottom line as well. Uh, as uh, Paul was saying, you know, the turnover was yes. extraordinary and it's really expensive to hire people and to train yes. them properly. Yeah. In fact, I was involved in a study at Westpac some 20 years ago which formed the business case for introducing paid maternity leave, which showed that every time we lost someone with six to 10 years experience, it cost between sixty-five dollars and $80,000 in recruitment and retraining costs and took at least six months before their replacement was at the same level of skill and experience, let alone cultural fit. So, you know, there's plenty of economic data to support having happy, productive employees. And it's not just the mm. cost of replacement. Um, happy employees make less mistakes. They treat your customers better and overall adds to the workplace environment. Another SMS says uh, punitive head kickers only send the message that they're dickheads and not creative, <laughs> so people leave. That's right, absolutely. Mm. Uh, Martin says, uh, re-command and control, as an ex-military officer myself, I can tell you that it matters not if troops are engaged or not in the combat role at present. The essence of instilling the sense of urgency, which must become instinctive, means necessarily that at uh, all times they're training for war. It's not an occupation to be chosen by politically correct-minded individuals. 
Mm. And look, and that's uh, very valid. And when I look at some of the incredible people I've met, uh, for example, in the commandos and the SAS, they are trained to not only operate as part of a team, but to operate as individuals and to know what to do as a matter of urgency. I suppose my comment about being more collaborative and more engaging is about how you treat people when you're in a situation that doesn't demand directive control and command behaviour. But absolutely, that doesn't mean we train them any less Mm. than you would normally because quite rightly, um, many of our military over the last 13 years have spent anywhere between six and 12 months and often more than once in the Middle East. Mm. SAS particularly, it must be a lot of strain on the families because, you know, you are almost, you know, I guess to put a a Hollywood spin on it, you know, you're a, a train killer and then you come back and you're part of a community. Yes. Um, you know, um, recently there was the movie The American Sniper, which I think showed quite well how, you know, somebody comes back from a war zone and, you know, on the surface everything appears to be fine, but underneath it all, you know, it's a long journey for them to come back from something like that to normal everyday life, which for the rest of us has continued as per normal. And that's why I think it's really important to have appropriate services and debriefings for those people when they return. And that uh, NWO says, uh, Tony, uh, the most important employee in a hospital are the cleaners. Without them, no one gets into the hospital, and that's from a nurse. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And uh, another uh, criticism here from one of the other SMSs saying Australian managers are highly defensive, embattled and take credit for other ideas. Um, It's interesting that that comment because um, I wouldn't disagree with it. Uh, There was a study done by uh, one of the major consulting firms a couple of years ago, I think about five years ago, where they found that Australian managers had a blame and avoidance management style, which basically meant that when something went wrong, they looked for something or someone to blame. So it was the supplier or it was the equipment or it's not my department's responsibility. I didn't know the gun was loaded. Yeah. And the avoidance piece is uh, we continue to be culturally a nation that prefers to avoid conflict. And so we would ignore the mole hill, which would ultimately become Mount Everest. And then that's when we get HR and lawyers and all sorts of people involved to sort out something that if we'd given, coming back to feedback, good feedback on a timely basis, we would have addressed that issue before it grew into something much bigger and more complex. Mm. Avril Henry with us tonight. Uh, What makes a good leader great? Uh, That's uh, what we've been talking about tonight. But uh, it doesn't have to be that grandiose. Uh, If you'd like to join in the conversation, uh, we've been talking about uh, Gen Y in particular, and uh, you know, making uh, adjustments so that uh, you know they join in the workforce and are, and are happy and productive. And uh, you know, there are a lot of um, different attitudes. Uh, for example, I was talking to an employer the other day, and he said uh, he finds with Gen Y these days that you know they're not looking for necessarily for a room to tomb job, and no. uh, they'll often say look, uh, I've had enough working for you at the moment, but uh, I may come back. Yes. And by the way, if they come back, they bring back other experience and possibly training and development that someone else paid for. And I've always said it's really important to allow people to leave with dignity and thank them for the contribution Mm. they've made, especially if they've been a good employee, because when they come back, you save money. With us in studio tonight, Avril Henry, and uh, we're talking about leadership and uh, what makes businesses grow and and uh, prosper. And uh, let's have a quick word with Scott. Scott, good evening to you. You uh, you're saying you found that the best bosses don't mind working at the coalface. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I've worked for a lot of different companies now, and uh, I've still got one boss that, or two bosses actually that stick stick in my mind, and they're all people that started, you know, at the bottom and put in the hard yards, work their way to the top. But when push come to shove, someone was crook or, uh, you know, was um, injured or, you know, didn't show up, they weren't afraid to jump in and, 
and do the job themselves, you know? Yeah. Uh, they, they had a real grounding, and the, the blokes working below them actually appreciated it and respected it. It also gives respect to the people who are at those, uh, you know, lower levels of the organisation that, uh, you know, the guys respect what you do and, you know, uh, up and it is a team thing, you know. It's, it's, yeah. it's not a bad bad idea. Yeah, no, it was, uh, yeah, like I've had two that really stand out and, um, you know, in a heartbeat, I'll go back and work for them any day of the week uh, just purely on, you know, their management. They were good at their job and they knew your job as well, so... If you had any dramas, they were able to ha- answer it and um, you, you were confident in what they were telling you. Absolutely. Um, and thanks for that, Scott, because I think, you know, what you are discussing is that they led by example and were willing to do what they were asking you to do. And I remember when I interviewed Father Chris Riley and I asked him what he thought an effective leader was. He said, someone who is willing to do the very things he or she asks others to do. And he said, people want evidence from their leaders that they understand and uh, totally agree. Yeah, it's, it's the same. And, you know, I've also worked for bosses that, you know, they, they're, they're probably good at what they do in the management side, but, um, you know, from the actual employee's perspective, it's quite obvious they, they don't understand what happens at the ground level. Absolutely. No. Scott, thanks so much for that. Uh, just an interesting comment from Paul from Waddle Grove. He says, uh, I work in the hospital system and your guest would be great to talk to our management. Uh, Bill, uh, you say bad performance in staff can generally be attributed to uh, the management style. Yes, it certainly can. Um, in my situation, I'm possibly be happy to go with the management and uh, I wonder I still have a job actually, um, simply because a lot of the personnel have adopted the I don't care attitude, I've got a job and I'll just do what I need to do rather than increase your performance and I think that a lot of that stems from management. Yes. Uh, it's almost a situation where monkey see, monkey do and you know, I've, I've, like me personally, I've been on both sides of the fence as a manager and also uh, as an employee and I can see a lot of flaws in their management. Yeah, I would agree. You know, if um, people don't feel motivated, they don't go the extra distance. And often that's because people don't feel valued. So, you know, as you quite rightly point out, they come in and they do the job they paid to do, but there's no additional discretionary effort. Yet when people feel valued, they will always put in extra effort, not only to do a good job, but to please the boss whom they feel values them. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I remember many years ago, I was in a situation where I managed a uh, food establishment and I saw the young appre- apprentice and she was inundated with dishes. And anyway, I just said to her, I said, uh, oh my goodness, they're going to grow on you. And she said, oh, I can't keep up. So I took my jacket off, shirt, uh, uh, tie in my shirt pocket, rolled, rolled up my sleeves and perhaps and the next morning I got a phone call from my father who just happened to be a prom solicitor in the town. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's all about action, not just words. And, you know, as they always say, as a leader, it's not what you say that people remember. It's not what you do that they remember. It's how you made them feel. And I think that is so true. Yeah, good on you, Bill. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we had an interesting comment. Mark in Leichhardt says, uh, working in HR, I have to agree, managers will avoid the hard decision or the conversation and then call for help when it's too late. Uh, <laughs> then there's normally only one solution and uh, it's not necessarily a good outcome for anybody. No. Uh, Robert, uh, you, you're saying not just a performance issue, it's also a, a workers' compensation issue as well. Oh, yes, and uh, your guest would know um, that... Um in the Workers' Compensation Courts of Australia, or among other countries, um, it's um, public record or well known amongst the um, lawyers and specialists that um, 70% of people in managerial positions are psychopathic. <laughs> uh, this is a well known fact. <laughs> And uh, they know that uh, the reason why the percentage is so high because uh, psychopaths um, work and strive a lot harder 
than other people to achieve a managerial position because they want to inflict lateral violence on people because this gives them joy. Uh, it's interesting, Robert. Uh, Anne uh, has just sent an SMS on a similar sort of issue. She says, do you think all the dependence on social media will help to create future managers who have narcissistic styles of management? Well, the, the, I'm sorry to interrupt there, but uh, there's a good way to fix it, and that is when, you get so, when, uh, when someone goes into a managerial position, they should do the full three-hour um, examination by a psychiatrist to determine whether they are psychopathic or not. That's an interesting... Um... Yeah, Robert, it sounds like you might have been bitten. <laughs> yeah. Twice. <laughs> 01 and 04. Oh, look, I think um, many, many people have found themselves in, in that position. You know, I say people join organisations, but they leave bad managers. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if the percentage is as high as 70%, uh, then uh, they should have a proper um, three-hour test with a, with a psychologist, not uh, 30 minutes with a psychologist. Mm test to see if they're not, um, you know. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are suggesting that uh, sometimes uh, some of the managers sort of steal the good ideas and, and then uh, and, uh, and steal the glory, and if it fails, uh, then they uh, blame somebody else for it. Well, that's the type of things that psychopaths do. That's the type of thing that they do. Yeah. <laughs> and not just at work. <laughs> What's oh, not just at work. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, they're found in other places. But in the workplace, it's 70%. I don't know what it is in other places. Yeah. Anyway, I just thought I'd tune you in on that. Yeah, Robert, thank you very thank much for you. that. Uh, just a couple of other um, ideas on the SMS. Uh, Phil and Bunbury says, uh, Tony, the best thing I learnt to continue to use to, to this day from my first boss in the late 70s is never ask anyone to do a task you haven't, won't or can't do yourself. It's um, a very good thing to, to follow. And uh, also um, another one saying MBA managers are compartmentalised in their mm. skill set mm. and don't know hands-on, so they don't understand what they're commanding. Yeah. And look, um, one of our earlier speakers made reference to good bosses who have come up through the ranks, and the combination of that together with not asking people to do things you wouldn't be willing to do yourself, I think is indicative of people wanting to know at a minimum that their boss actually understands what they do. And look, sometimes when you're the boss, there are things your staff do that you can't do. I'm the first to admit that I'm technologically challenged and there are lots of things I can't do without my staff. But what I will do is give them my support when I'm asking them to do that and saying, you know, if this is going to take you longer than I'd like it to take you, you just need to explain to me why. Because obviously it's complex and because I lack the understanding or experience, um, I just need you to help educate me. So I think leaders also need to be open to being educated by their subordinates mm. and, you know, recognise that leaders don't know everything. But I think it's fantastic that we don't need to know everything if we listen to our people and surround ourselves with good people. A lot of people, uh, I, su I suppose really when you think about it, it's, uh, it's the old suggestion box from 50 years ago, you know, where you know, the staff suggestion box was put there and probably dismissed uh, out, of, uh, out of hand. But uh, sometimes, you know, people yeah. certainly at, uh, at ground level know what's going wrong with the organisation. Look, one of the best people I've ever had the a good fortune to work with as a consultant was Angus Houston when he was the Chief of Defence. And I always remember him saying to me, you learn much more by asking good questions than you ever learn just from telling people what to do. Mm -hmm. Just uh, backing up a, a couple of earlier statements, uh, James says, I'm a manager in a major public sector organisation in Victoria. I think most of my management colleagues are sociopaths. <laughs> <sighs> no, it's, it's not easy being green, is it? <laughs> no, and look, I, I often say that um, the workplace does have what I call some emotional emotional vampires and oxygen thieves and if you work for one of those then just stay out of the firing line.
Mm, or quit. <laughs> yes, or change careers. <laughs> Could be an answer. Mm. Avril, uh, always a pleasure to catch up. Uh, thank you so much for having a chat tonight. Thank you so much for having me. It's always fun, Tony. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a difficult issue, I think, for management and staff sometimes to make sure everyone is pointed in the right direction. Uh, Avril Henry, what makes a good leader.